Hey, everybody. Great one today, you know, for a change. I know you're thinking, Al, you, you say that every week, and it's never true. And I will acknowledge that, and I figure something out, which is that I should wait until I've done the interview to decide whether it's any good or not. So that's exactly what I'm going to uh, uh, do starting next week. Well, I have every reason to believe that finally, finally, I'm going to have a great one because Paul Begala is my guest. Jesus, Al, how would you get Paul Begala? Well, I'll tell you a little secret. When we book my guests, we send them a sample reel of the show, and it's, it's heavily edited. So what they'll get is, hey, everybody, we've got a great one today. Jeffrey Tubin is my guest. Hey, everybody, we've got a great one today. Steve Schmidt is my guest. Hey, everybody, we've got a great one today. Sarah Silverman is my guest. Hey, everybody, we've got a great one today. Michelle Obama is my guest. And no, we have not had Michelle Obama, but they don't know that. (laughs) So today I have the legendary Paul Begala. And by all rights, this very well could be our first great one. Uh, You all know Paul, of course, as the stable half of the political consulting team of Begal and Carville that uh, catapulted an obscure, taciturn candidate, Bill Clinton, to the presidency in 1992 and then re-elected him by a wide margin in 1996. And after that, uh, Paul did a three-year stint as co-host on Crossfire with National Treasure Tucker Carlson. He is the author of a new book, You're Fired or You're Fired. It doesn't have an exclamation point, does it? Uh, no, we couldn't afford it. it was a, it's a budget bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too bad. You can't buy an exclamation point? Well, you know, I'm a fiscal conservative, so I had to, you know, cut back. You also, I, 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 I saw you as, the, as I was writing the book and told you about it. You were very supportive. And I said, uh, gee, if anybody knows uh, uh, books and, and, and uh, how to make them successful, it's you. Four number one New York Times bestsellers. Thank you. Not bad. Thank you for reminding people. So I said, I need help on the title. Uh, and do you remember the, the title you suggested when I told you it was a book about, you know, why we should defeat Trump and how, how to defeat Trump? No. What did I? You said, defeat the MF. <laughs> and you suggested where to put the asterisks. So my joke is always like, put F U C K asterisk R. <laughs> <laughs> And then you had a subtitle, though. You remember? No. What was it the was subtitle? Defeat the MF and other ways to restore civility to our national discourse. <laughs> yeah. That's the formula. <laughs> That's the formula. <laughs> it's, it's so great. Well, anyway, it's just hit the bookstores. And it's a really is a how-to guide on getting rid of uh, a deranged, uh, mendacious employee. Uh, if he's running for a second term. So welcome, Paul. Thank you, Al. This is a great thrill. It's an honor. Likewise. First, I want to thank you. Uh, I hope you remember this for coming to Minnesota for me back in 2008. It was right at the beginning of the recount. You remember that? I do. I remember it well. I was so impressed by both you and by your supporters in that the the lack of hysteria. You were so calm. Your supporters were so <laughs> calm. I was terribly worried they were going to steal this thing from you. And, you know, I don't know Minnesotans like you do. And they, they struck me as very, <laughs> very different from my fellow Texans, right? They're really kind and process uh, <laughs> driven. They just wanted an honest outcome. And, and so did you. And I, I was really impressed. Well, you know, the DFLers, Democratic Farmer Labor Party, DFLers, is nothing they love more than a training. <laughs> so so we, th- that's what you came to. We, we had to train hundreds and hundreds of folks to represent me at the counting tables because we in Minnesota you count everything by hand in a recount and so we had this training event and we wanted to attract even more volunteers than we were going to get and so we had you and Bradley Whitford from the West Wing show up to Minnesota and of course we got a quite a crowd do you remember the chant I led do you remember I remember it well it was what do we want patience (laughs) when do we want it now Patience now, patience. I got him doing that, right? I thought it was great. Yes, it was so much fun. Okay, so the book is really uh, just a, a, a great outline, just a great companion for this cycle uh, on how to beat Donald Trump. And y- you start with me a culpa on because you were part of a super PAC in 2016, right? 
the uh, the the main super PAC uh, that was supposed to be attacking Trump. Uh, I was a senior advisor to them. <laughs> and that was kind of the problem is that you're just attacking Trump, isn't it? That's what you say in here. Yes, but how we were attacking him. I don't think a super PAC can give you the candidates, you know, uh, deeply held beliefs, even though I know and love Hillary for a quarter century. That was her job. Right, right. Then the super PAC's job is to attack because right. that way the campaign itself can be more uplifting, right? Right. And that seemed to be a good division of labor. What I got wrong was I thought that Trump's sewer level character would be enough <laughs> to bring him down and that mm -hmm. no person could vote for him after learning the truth about what he said about women, about people of color, about immigrants, about Muslims, about POWs, about disabled people. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. And I was wrong. I didn't close the loop. I didn't connect up these horrible things he said with the lives of folks, you know, in Minnetonka, why their lives would be worse if this horrible person became our president. And that was a cardinal mistake. And it's one that I'm begging Democrats to not make this time, which is make it about the voters lives, not Trump's. Trump is uh, all those things I just said. But the worst is he's making your life worse. That that voting for Trump, not only, you not only get a person of just appalling character, you get a guy whose piggish behavior sort of distracts you from his stunning incompetence and corruption. We have seen his incompetence and corruption for the last three and a half years, but particularly in the last several months. How big a factor is his handling of the coronavirus going to be in uh, in this election, everything it will be dominant, and it should be, because it takes away Trump's two greatest strengths as a politician. First, his ability to divert; he diverts attention wonderfully. Now he does it by saying racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic things, but he does. He's really good at turning the camera away from something by creating some other outrage. He's unable to do that here. We cannot turn away from 140,000 dead. So he's lost that power, the power of diversion. By the way, he uses division to divert. The second thing I think that he used to have going for him that worked for him in 2016 that I did not fully appreciate, that you did, was he was judged by a different standard because he was a reality show host. And he made politics into spectacle and a spectator sport. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did I understand that? Why Because you you're smarter than I Suggesting that. No, you're saying because I used to be in show business. That's what you're saying. I think you have a deeper appreciation <laughs> uh, having been in show business. Yeah. And I think I missed that entirely. I missed entirely. it too. <laughs> Did you really? I completely missed I really thought like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, how can anybody be for this guy? That's what I thought. And I thought like, I, I know Americans. Th this guy tops out at 30%. I, I swear to God. Americans are not racist. They are not xenophobic. They aren't this guy. They don't can't buy this guy. They can't. And I was I was as wrong as anybody, frankly. And I also, you know, I didn't know about what Comey would do. I didn't know yeah. what the Russians were doing. I didn't know all the other aspects. And also, I love Hillary. I did not understand how much people did not like Hillary. And that's from 20 some years right. of attacks on her. Right. In fact, had she won, she would have been the president who had been a national political figure longer than any president since the founding generation. One thing I want to point out is what was her approval rating uh, among Americans when she left uh, oh. the State Department? O over 60 percent. She was one. Of, uh, by the way, Hillary Clinton, in the history of the Gallup poll, most admired woman in the world, has earned that title more than any other woman in history beating out such non-entities as Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think because our super PAC ran a bunch of negative ads against Mother Teresa. Yeah, those were vicious. Jesus those Christ. were terrific. Yeah. And for <laughs> no reason. <laughs> she wasn't even running against you. You just had some extra money. We had extra money. We wanted Hillary to be the most admired person <laughs> one more time. Uh, but I was, I, I was, um, I was blind to the differing standards. And I put this in the book. My brother, Dave, who's a very successful businessman in construction in Houston. He said this to me. He, he loves Hillary and voted for her. 
Uh, but he said, you know, when people heard Hillary, they said, oh, she's a politician. She's an effing liar. When they heard Trump, they just said, oh, he's a bullshit artist because he's a TV star. And so they had completely different, the, the, the fact checkers, by the way, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post and others, they, they would check everything. Hillary was the most truthful candidate of the 20 <laughs> something candidates. She got things right more than everyone else who ran that year. And yet they had the election taken away from her by the biggest liar in the history of the world. Let's get back to beating Trump, shall we? Please. Okay, so, I mean, obviously the coronavirus is, I mean, because he did not have a cr real crisis, a real crisis right. until this, right? So he kind of skated through, and the economy was the greatest economy that anyone <laughs> had ever built, which is actually, he it was a glide path from uh, from Obama, right? Right. Created fewer jobs in the, the first 30 months of his presidency than Obama did in the last 30 months of his. So in other words, it was gliding down. Uh, he also, I, I do think Democrats should put him on trial for what he did and failed to do for the economy before the crash. And that, that Trump tax cut for the rich is politically toxic for him. And I think Democrats should make that case. That he handed $2.3 trillion of our money to corporate CEOs, and it did nothing to stimulate the economy. Nothing. And that's an awful lot of money. I draw the contrast with Barack Obama, who saved the whole global economy and certainly the American economy for about eight hundred and fifty billion. So Obama with, spent with less stimulus. and did more with his st stimulus package and recovery package in two thousand nine. You know, not only did that tax cut not stimulate the economy as they said it would, but it added over a trillion to the deficit, and that's one of the things that just pisses me off so much because I was on the floor during that and I would go up to the Republicans who were managing that thing and I, I'd say like, you know, this is going to this is going to add a trillion bucks to the deficit. Your own CBO says this, right? The Congressional Budget Office that you appointed right. says this. Oh, no, it won't. It's going to stimulate the economy so much that it won't create, you know, because of dynamic scoring. <laughs> right. And of course, they were just they don't care about deficits. Do they? No, no, they don't. And they, they don't care about our money. Uh, they, they took it and they gave it to corporate America. Again, maybe corporate profits were an issue. Corporate taxes maybe were out of date. It's, a, it's kind of above my pay grade. But I know this, before the Trump tax cut for corporate America was passed, before corporations had their highest profits in history. So, so they may have had problems. They may have needed to update the tax code in some ways, but it was not a crisis in the same way that, for example, opioids is a crisis, which Trump, I think, has done very little about. We're in the same way that infrastructure, our roads, our water systems. Good Lord, you can't drink the water in some places. That's a crisis. There, there's a health care crisis. There were real, real crises that Trump could have attacked with $2 trillion of our money and done a lot of good and, frankly, done a lot of good for himself politically. But he chose not to. And that was a tragic choice. It, it, it bankrupted the country. It did not help the economy. It's making it much harder for us to, to get through this uh, COVID crash. And he should be held to account for that. B by the way, Al, I know you know this, but do you know how he intends to deal with the deficit that he's created? I actually don't. He has proposed in la this year's budget and last year's $2 trillion of cuts in Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. That's how he wants to restore fiscal balance. So the deficit was not created by Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. It was created in this instance by the Trump tax cut for the rich. But he wants to pay for it by cutting Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, even though his politically his best age cohort is over 65. Well, it was. I, I think COVID, he's losing support among older racists. Yes. <laughs> he, he is doing worse with seniors. And in his first race... In 16, he said he'd never cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. That was part of his platform, right? In fact, yes. And in the closing days of the campaign, promises. bizarrely accused Hillary of wanting to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Because he projects, right? That's what he does. Anything he's guilty of, he accuses the other person of. No puppet, no puppet, you're the puppet. Remember in the debate when Hillary said, you're, you're going to be Putin's puppet? That's a tell with him, right? When he said Hillary's going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, it turns out what he meant was, I am going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Yeah, he's not always spot on when it comes to <laughs> literally telling the truth. 
Uh, that's for sure. So let's get back to COVID and this election. I mean, it's pretty clear, and I think Americans have seen this. Uh, in fact, my worry about this is that it's so clear that we're going to start thinking this is a slam dunk, right? That's one of the fears. Right. But I Absolutely. also kind of think the answer to that is that, one, they are going to do everything to suppress votes. And, right. two, uh, if it's close, he may not leave. Are you right about that? But this is my hope. The last one we thought was a slam dunk. Right. And it wasn't. And I think that every Democrat, every progressive, every independent who's looking at this guy going like, no, 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 we can't do this again, is going to vote. They are going to vote. They're going to turn out and vote. I think you're right. That's the, that's the story of 2018, where uh, under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi, who I love, we had the highest turnout in a midterm in a century since the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. Um, it, it, it is, there's something going on out there, but I think you are right. Your column at CNN.com was excellent because you're you. sounding the warning. The complacency is a worry, but I think you're right. We're so freaked out by the last election. I'm less worried about complacency, but voter suppression is a bigger one. They are doing everything they can to make it harder, especially for people of color and younger voters to participate. And I do outline that in the book, particularly in Georgia, a state I love. The governor should be Stacey Abrams. But he was, Brian Kemp is now serving as governor. He was secretary of state. So he was running the election the same time he was running in the election. And the purging of voters and the manipulation of polling places was so striking uh, as to cost Stacey Abrams the election. And it's not just me. Independent analysts have, have looked at this and said that. So I think that's sure. a terrific concern. Voter suppression is real and they're out there doing it. In part, they're able to do it. Because Thief Justice Roberts gutted the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And I know we're all supposed to pretend that we like him because he voted with us on a couple of issues. I don't. The, the most important law I think passed in my lifetime was the Voting Rights Act. Your friend and mine, John Lewis, shed blood for that. And Congress had reauthorized it with, with your participation and support almost unanimously. And then Chief Justice Roberts just stands up and says no. And he takes out Section 5, which required states and localities to clear changes in the voting procedure before they could enact them to make sure that they didn't discriminate against black people. So they are empowered to do this now by the chief and by this terrible case, uh, Shelby County versus Holder. So I think we have to really be on our guard against that. And we have to fight like hell. Uh, a guy I quoted there at great length, Mark Elias, who's the premier election and voting rights lawyer in America. Mark is my lawyer and was there uh, in 2008 when you came and uh, helped me there and did the recount, of course. Mark is a frequent guest on the Al Franken podcast, and we are really focused very much on uh, voter suppression and vote by mail, which they're trying to prevent. And uh, we, we have our eye on that. And one thing Mark says, and I, I want to say this almost every time I have the chance to, he says one of the most important things that my listeners can do is sign up to be poll workers because we're assuming that COVID will be around then. Right. Uh, about, I don't know, is it two-thirds or three-quarters of poll workers are above 60 and uh, half above 70, and we need young people to man those man the polls. If we don't have poll workers, the lines will be longer. It'll be harder right. to vote. That's really good advice, and I'm glad you and, and Mark are raising that with people. It's absolutely important. We don't want to put anybody at risk. But by, by the way, the vote by mail, that is particularly mm -hmm. outrageous. Of course, Donald Trump <laughs> votes by mail. Many of his staff vote by mail. The, the, the state of Utah does almost entirely vote by mail, and uh, it's certainly not rigged or biased toward the Democrats. There are five states. There are five states that vote 100 percent by mail and there's no fraud. There's just isn't. right. Right. It, but th there's an interesting thing going on politically. And I've talked to pollsters who are picking this up. The more Trump says don't vote by mail, the more Trump voters say they're not going to vote by mail. <laughs> and the more Democrats say, well, hell, if he's against it, I'm for it. I'm, I, I maybe should do that. In other words, this may be boomeranging on him. He has a lot of voters over 65. I don't want anyone to get sick. I don't want anybody to put themselves in harm's way. But he may be 
stupidly suppressing his own vote more than the Democratic vote. Part of the thing I wrote in that CNN piece is that when your opponent is digging himself a hole, let him dig. Right. And it seems like Trump is continually digging himself a hole and continues to do that. The latest being that he doesn't want uh, in this next package that Congress is going to pass. He wants to cut uh, funding for, for testing and for contact tracing. People know that's insane, right? Yes. Yes. They are watching in their lives the consequences of a failed presidency. It's no longer a reality show. This is not just a Twitter war between Donald Trump and Rosie O'Donnell. This is about your mom <laughs> in a nursing home. This is about your kid in a preschool. This is about your job and your health and your life. And when he says we don't want testing, it is, it's so spectacularly dumb. When we test more, we get more cases. No, no, no. But by the way, it, 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 it's just, it's so stupid. I don't even have to explain why. It, it is so tragic. I mean, we, we're America. We, we are, you say this in your article. It's so true. We all were raised on American exceptionalism. We, I was raised to believe this country can do anything and we can. And to have our country which has the greatest uh, medical system and the greatest doctors and the greatest public health infrastructure for our country to be attacked this way by this virus because of the incompetence of our president is just heartbreaking. The fact that that is happening is because elections matter. And there's no, there's no person who could ever convince me that if Hillary Clinton, with her vast experience in healthcare and her vast knowledge, there's nobody convinced me that she would be attacking Anthony Fauci and saying, let's not test people to see if they have this potentially deadly virus because we don't want to know. Yeah. I mean, the other countries that have approached this successfully, and it's a lot of them, <laughs> have done exactly, exactly, exactly what Fauci has said to do, which is social distancing, wear masks, testing, and then contact tracing. You know, uh, Andy Slavitt, who's on this show quite a bit, mm -hmm. he and Scott Gottlieb, former head of the FDA, put together a plan to use 150,000 people to do contact tracing and pay for those people who are positive or have been in contact with people who are positive and then get tested to go to a hotel for two weeks so that hotels actually get paid. That's how you stop this. Right. I, I spoke to a contact tracer, uh, not because I was exposed, but just uh, uh, one of my son's friends is uh, working a as a contact tracer. And she said the level of cooperation and participation is terrible. And she did not say why, but I think in part it's because our president is telling people that that's not a, a, a useful strategy. And it is the strategy. So this is what Speaker Pelosi says, and she gets this from the scientists. Test, trace, isolate, treat. That's what we need to be doing. I, I spoke to someone else, one of my best friends, Steve Domenico, who you may have met. He was an advanced man in the Clinton days. He's working on the Navajo Nation now. And part of what he is doing is bringing um, uh, isolation units to uh, Native American homes where, you know, if, you, if you've got a very small home and you've got four or five or 10 people living in it, it's impossible to isolate. And so what uh, this charity that my friend Steve is, is working for does is they drive out there and set up a structure outside your house. So you don't have to leave. You don't have to go anywhere. You just go right there. In other words, we can do this. We can. We, we have the brains and we have the heart. We just don't have the leadership. God bless them because they have been hit really hard in the Southwest and the Navajos have Particularly been. Particularly there. It's heartbreaking. It really is. And there are places that have no running water. I mean, that's another aspect of this, which is the uh, disparities here and how much this is falling on people of color. There's so many aspects of this that you know the president doesn't care about in the slightest. Well, that's what's heartbreaking. They say he doesn't even care about the people who he leads. And, it, you know, that's pretty extraordinary. He, he doesn't even care about the people who voted for him, which is pretty unusual for a politician. The, the, I think the very worst thing is that he's turned a blind eye to Vladimir Putin putting a target on our troops back. Putin is reportedly paying Taliban terrorists to murder Americans. And Trump learns of this and then invites Putin to rejoin 
the G7 leaders of the free world. I, I, it is extraordinary. I, I, I it's, 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 I'm, you can tell I'm at a loss for words. How, what do you do about a man who does not give a rip snort if his own people are dying of a virus and if his own soldiers are being targeted by terrorists? How do you, you just have to fire him. We've had Malcolm Nance on, on this uh, podcast mm-hmm. and pretty much laid out a very, very, very convincing case that he is an asset. He's a Russian asset. There's compromat on him. And I don't know if there's any other possible interpretation, really. Oh, I mean, you write about it. You write about the meeting he had with Kislyak and uh, right after he fathered Comey and right. gave them classified intelligence. I mean, what he did in Ukraine, everything he does, there's not, no interpretation of that. You even write about uh, his meetings at summits with uh, Putin, where he has an interpreter who he has destroyed the notes. I mean, come on. It's really hard not to buy that there is. a that, and, and how could he not have taken money from the Russians? And that's their that's how they do it. Right. I suppose it's not my field, but there is no good explanation. I know that <laughs> uh, my, I have friends who are for Trump. OK, I do. And and yeah. uh, I. What they say is what Trump says, which is like literal nonsense. They say, well, it's good to get along with Russia. Not bad. It's good. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What? Getting along with them doesn't mean letting them kill our troops. It doesn't mean. In fact, let me tell your listeners about that Kislyak meeting, because it's, again, as someone who used to work, I started every morning in the Oval Office when I worked for President Clinton. That's the sanctum sanctorum, right? You don't bring just anybody in there. And usually the protocol is only a head of state or head of government gets a meeting in the Oval. So this, Kislyak was the ambassador and reported to be a spy. Sergei Lavrov was the foreign minister, not the head of government or the head of state. Trump brings them, this is five months into his term, brings them into the Oval Office, which eh, it's a little bit of a breach if you ask me, but he's the president, he gets to decide. And in the Oval Office, he does not allow American media in. He does allow Russian media in, including a Russian photographer who many uh, former Intel operatives later said could easily have brought listening devices or other spyware into the Oval Office. And then in the meeting, he tells Kislyak, a spy, ultra top secret information that later was reported that we obtained from our allies in Israel. That means that the Russians not only got the intel, they got the sources and methods. And I'm sure Malcolm has said this. I, I, I just it was not my field, but I learned enough being around it in the White House. Sources and methods are the Holy Grail. And you protect that literally at all costs. And so this guy, if any other American did that, they'd go to prison. And it, it should be a crime that the president does, but he's, he can waive classification anytime he wants because he's the classifying authority. The fact that he gave a Russian spy top secret information from our closest ally in the Middle East, uh, again, uh, there's no good explanation. Why would he do that? I mean, you cover this in the book. You cover that meeting. And this is sort of a compendium <laughs> of the case against him in spades. And let's talk about some of the other things that you talk about in terms of winning this thing. Um, for example, let's just talk about health care, for God's sakes. Because I think, right. as you point out, 18 was all about health care. And it was, you know, in the aftermath of John McCain doing the thumbs down, thank God, so that the ACA was not unraveled. And Americans looked at this and said, wait a minute, they were going to replace this with something that wouldn't necessarily protect people with pre-existing conditions. That freaked people out. Right. And that was the overriding issue in that campaign, and that's why we picked up 41 seats. Right. My and- concern during this campaign And this gets me to African-Americans and the role that they played in this campaign thus far, which is after Nevada, it looked a lot like that Bernie would be the nominee. And in South Carolina, I think African-Americans in South Carolina said, we want to win. Right. And I think they were afraid of Medicare for all. And not that I'm against Medicare for all. When I got to the Senate, I... I had, I had campaigned for Bernie a number of times before I got there. And I said to Bernie, uh, you know, if 
you like, I'll join you on, on, you know, Medicare for all, but you know, we're 58 votes short. (laughs) So we won 41 swing districts because they were swing districts. Right. And we won them because suburban women said, wait a minute, I want to protect us in case we get a pre-existing condition in my family. We already have one. And I like our insurance. Obama's biggest mistake was if you like your plan, you can keep it, and that not being true. Right. People like their plans more or less. We have a lot to do in terms of reforming our health care system and the way insurance companies work and the way especially the way pharmaceutical companies work. Right. And didn't you feel that? Didn't you feel that it was like the African American voters in South Carolina went, whoa, 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 whoa. Absolutely. It's, it better be Biden. Absolutely. Uh, and and to, to really drill down, Jim Clyburn has a special place in history. He's a veteran congressman from South Carolina. He stepped up and endorsed Joe Biden going into the South Carolina primary when Biden had been beaten badly in Iowa and New Hampshire. And that really galvanized support for Joe. And I think it's exactly what you're saying. You know this, but I, some of my friends uh, on the other side don't understand this. The heart and soul of the Democratic Party is people of color, especially African-American women. And when Joe was able to run so strongly in that community, I think some of it was that he'd earned it from many years as President Obama's vice president and many years in the Senate. He also, I think you're right, that was talking to a community that uh, I think they wanted reconciliation more than revolution. And that's what Joe offered. This healthcare issue, you're right, it has not gone away. It was the biggest issue of 2018. It should be the biggest issue in 2020. I think it is. And I, I'm sure your listeners know this, but as we speak, Donald Trump and his administration is in federal court trying to take away the Affordable Care Act, which protects people who have pre-existing conditions. And because I had to, I chose to write a book about it, I looked it up. 129 million Americans under the age of 65 have a pre-existing condition. Over 65, we don't worry about them because you can't lose your Medicare. 129 million. That's half of us, roughly. Half of the people. And by the way, if you don't have one now, just hold tight. You'll get one. Because as you move closer to past 50 and 60, it gets like 85% of us have a pre-existing condition. And Trump is in court asking the federal courts to throw all that out. And leave yourselves to the tender mercies of the insurance companies to empower them once again to dump you if you commit the sin of having a pre-existing condition, which can include being a woman. The National Women's Law Center, I cite this in the book, did a study on this. And insurance companies have in the past excluded women from health care because they had been a victim of domestic violence. They considered that a pre-existing condition because they had had a cesarean section. That was considered a pre-existing condition. The, the discrimination in that system against women and people of color was so vast, it's still problematic, but it was so much worse. If you throw out the ACA, it's going to hurt a lot of people. And I, I think people need to vote like their lives depend on it because it does. Well, of course, uh, Trump, one of the things he said, well, we're going to replace it, the Affordable Care Act. Remember, he said he was going to do that with something terrific. Right. And, and then he, then when it failed, this is what he said. He said, who knew health care was complicated? <laughs> And the answer to that was, everybody, you schmuck. (laughs) Everyone who's ever been to the doctor, everyone who's ever fought with an insurance company. I remember the argument used to be like, well, okay, the Affordable Care Act says there there should be a mandate. Everyone should get insurance. We don't want any free riders, right? Right. And people go, that's not fair. You shouldn't have to buy insurance if you're not sick. Yeah, you should. Everybody who's got a car has to buy car insurance. Well, some people don't, don't have cars. Okay, then they don't have to buy car insurance, but everybody does have a body, and everybody is going to get sick sometime, unless I don't know you eat it uh, early, <laughs> right? You're just gonna get sick. <laughs> I mean, that's that's like much much higher percentage than people get in a car accident. Much higher. And and now we see this. <laughs> like, it, we're in the middle of a pandemic. That, that's the thing. There is a deadly virus. Again, I was a liberal arts major. I've never seen a virus or a germ, but I believe Dr. Fauci when he says they're there. I can't see them, but that's okay. 
it's a deadly virus in a lot of cases. And in the middle of a pandemic that so far has killed 140,000 of us, really, this is the time to get rid of health care? Well, uh, immediately, that, look at all the people who have lost their jobs and where are they going? Millions have been going to the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, that's you can if you get if you lose your job, you can go to the Affordable Care Act and get covered as opposed to doing COBRA, where right. you have to basically pay the, the entire full boat of what you and your employer together paid. And there are some people who are doing that, and they're using the extra $600 a week in unemployment compensation that the Democrats got in the last CARES Act. So they're using that $600. It's getting eaten up entirely by COBRA, health insurance cost. And so the Republicans want that $600 to be taken away from you. The one thing that's keeping body and soul together, uh, it, it is, it, it, it's just indescribably cruel. Well, you know, some people stupid. are getting more, more than what they would get from their job. So it's Andy work <laughs> because they're getting 600. They're literally friggin' saying that. Right. So we've driven the minimum wage down so low <laughs> that now we're going to complain that people get unemployment compensation when they lose their job. And in I some heard cases, that on the way in here, I was listening to C-SPAN as I am for some reason want to do. And it was a house, <laughs> it was a house hearing and they had Bernanke and uh, some of the other former Fed chairs, they were saying the same thing, which is you need to do this. <laughs> right. You need to do this. Then there was some Republican representative from Indiana who was going like, there are people getting more from the 600 than they got when they were working. And that's anti-work. And shouldn't we have some pro-work incentive by cutting that? <laughs> it was like, Jesus. Well, th this is what Jesus. folks have to know, <laughs> is that it's not just Trump. It's Trumpism. And it's why, as you argue in your CNN piece, I argue in my book, we not just have to beat him. We have to discredit him and his philosophy so that other Congress members, senators, governors don't follow in their place. I don't know if you saw this. The governor of Missouri said, well, of course, kids are going to go back to school and of course they're going to get COVID, but they're not going to go in the hospital. They're kids. They'll just go home and get better <laughs> it's fine they get better but when they go home there's another step what is, what would that well yeah the, there's mom and dad and <laughs> nana and grandpa it, it's it is so spectacularly stupid and that's why we have to discredit the whole regime because you know i i don't know governor parson of missouri and i'm sure he's a lovely man but i do know nicole galloway the democrat who's running against him and she's terrific and as I, I've already done some campaigning with her virtually. And, and then I saw, so I particularly noticed this clip this morning when the governor said that. Um, that's just institutionalized stupidity and cruelty to not care whether <laughs> children get sick. Like that didn't come from a political consultant. Let me defend my profession. I don't think a political consultant, when you say, Governor, I have a great idea. Tell people you don't give a rip snort if their kids get sick and then bring a deadly virus home to Nana. Well, in his defense, he had the president's. <laughs> You have the president saying, if you stop testing, you won't have any new cases. Oh. I I would submit that that is every bit as stupid, if not more stupid. It is. And again, I have a lot of friends uh, who, who, who support Trump. You grew up <laughs> where I did. Stupid. <laughs> I, I really have friends who are upset about this mask thing, and I cannot wrap my mind around that. Because what they're saying simultaneously is to wear a mask, which is to protect other people, that that's tyranny for the governor I live in Virginia. My governor's a doctor. He issued a mask order. I'm following it. I figure again, Dr. Northam, my governor, probably knows more about this stuff than I do. And so I wear a mask. And it's not tyranny, actually, to tell you the truth. But I, And I'm okay with it. But it, for my Trump friends, it is tyranny to wear a mask. But for unmarked paramilitary federal troops in Portland to arrest people, beat them, tear gas them, that's okay? <laughs> that's not tyranny? Like, what the hell? What What if we, I suppose they'd be up in arms if federal troops in Portland were handing out face masks? That would be tyranny, Al. Tyranny the, is in, in the mind's eye. <laughs> I can't remember. I think it was in California, just a town meeting where they had all these people who were saying that this is a violation of my freedom to make me wear a mask. I remember there was some woman who was just furious because if she wears a mask, the C. O2, the CO2 that she exhales mm -hmm. will come back 
in her lungs. And that she'll oh, have to be inhaling CO2. But the government's uh, making her do that. Again, I'm not a doc, but it seems to me that's what happens. <laughs> that's what happens when you wear a plastic bag over your head. <laughs> not a, a cloth mask, ma'am. You know, and he is not below 38%. or and he, I don't think he's below 40%, no. really. Or We don't know. What is that? What, I, I mean, I have theories about this. Uh, one of which is a theory which gives them some credit. You want to hear my theory? Yes. Uh, yes. Which is, okay, let's say you're from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Sure. And you visit Washington, D.C., and you see all these gleaming buildings and all these fancy restaurants, and clearly people in Washington, D.C., in the government, are doing really well in this government town. Right. Not just in the government, but lobbyists, et cetera. And you go like, I haven't seen any of this happening in, in Wilkes Bar. I haven't seen any of this. These people in this government town, it's all self-dealing. And when Donald Trump, when he ran, he was going to end that. He was going to drain the swamp. <laughs> now, the first part about that, I understand. I understand why people don't like elites. Right. I mean, who can blame them? You know, and, and when this town is awash with wealth and that so much of that is in campaign finance, it's in it's thanks to Citizens United, which, all, which Roberts also voted uh, right. for, but it's also about just lobbying. I mean, you write about lobbying in this. So people look at that, and I can see why people who are very, very, very suspicious of what they consider the elites, and, and they have to look at Democrats every bit as much a part of that, right? I think that's very astute, and I think it's why the very first bill Speaker Pelosi introduced, H.R. 1, was Congressman John Sarbanes' uh, reform bill, the For the People Act. And uh, I, I, go, I walk through it in the book because it is, it, if enacted, it's passed the House, it's been sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk for nearly a year now, and it would do more to reform our government, certainly than anything since Watergate, more to protect the right to vote than anything since the Voting Rights Act. It would restore the Voting Rights Act that we talked about before. It would uh, have automatic voter registration for people when they turn 18. It would end the kind of voter suppression. It would restrict the power of lobbyists. It would cut down on the influence of campaign donations. It is a sweeping remarkable bill. And in, in the book, I call it the most important legislation you've never heard of. And Democrats need to get behind that. And they have in the House, and they're trying in the Senate. Your former colleagues are doing all they can, but they don't have the numbers. I do hope uh, that Vice President Biden will campaign on that more, because uh, I think uh, you're right that there were, there were, I do believe a lot of good people voted for Trump, and I didn't get it at the time, but I think you're right. There was a, a desire for a wrecking ball and to just destroy all the corruption and crap in Washington. Well, Okay, I, they, they have a good point on that. But as I note in the book, 187 lobbyists are running our government now. Straight, it turns out, straight from the industries they used to That's lobby That's in for. the administration. In, in, the administration. in the administration. In the, in the Trump administration, he's put uh, 187 lobbyists. And, you know, oddly, in pretty much, not pretty much, in every single case, they are running the part of the government that they used to lobby for special interests. So like oil guys are in charge of the environment. Health industry. That's not new. That's not new with Republican administrations. That was the case yeah. in W. It was. Th that's been the case before. That's what they do. That's right. And they have they, industry lobbyists come and run the federal agencies. <laughs> and there's there's revolving doors on the Democratic Party too. You know, former you know FCC commissioners going to industry, and we do have a lot of people going from being regulators and then going into private industry, right? Right. And this H.R. 1, the For the People Act, would restrict that, too. Um, I, I think that um, Democrats are the party of reform and they ought to campaign on it. And we should never cede that ground. And here, the problem with with bringing in a wrecking ball is sometimes it swings the other way and hits your house. And I know they wanted to tear down the, the, the corruption in Washington. But in fact, what they got was the most corrupt president in modern history, maybe ever. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is it's just laden with cronies. And also, people don't know what they're doing. 
So part of my in my op ed on on CNN was basically the good thing about what Biden when when he does really full throatedly campaign and hopefully he can you know physically but uh, is that the things that he is for the American people are for which is to build on Obamacare not destroy it right it's to build infrastructure. As I say in it, I say Americans would like to see highways and bridges and railroads that re- at least resemble the rest of the developed world. Okay, I, I want to ask you if you remember this. Do you remember right after Scott Brown won in Massachusetts that we had a meeting of the Senate caucus, uh, Democratic Senate caucus, at the Nationals Ballpark? And it was right after that election, and basically, because Scott Brown had won, we now had 59. Right. So we had a problem, which is now we couldn't go to conference with the House after they passed it, right? Right. And The Affordable and Care Act. Smooth, the Affordable Care Act. Here's who was there. It was you, I think, were kind of acting as MC. Tim Kaine was there, who was head mm-hmm. of the DNC at the time, and Axelrod. And I recall this very plainly. Um, President came, and along with him, the cameras, et cetera, and spoke to us. He left. Then all the press left. We were having a private thing. I think you spoke, and I was waiting for our instructions, or I thought we were going to talk about how we were going to get this damn thing passed. Right how we're going to get this legislation to the president to sign. And so I believe you talked, uh, Tim talked, and neither of you talked about that. And I'm going like, I was getting madder and madder and Axelrod. <laughs> so I'm going, okay, I get it. They're just having Axelrod talk about it. I mean, he's in the White House and he doesn't. It was like steam coming out of my ears. Yeah. And, you know, I thought, you know, each of you spoke for about five minutes and, First minute went past with him, and I went like, when, 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 when's he going to do it? Two minutes, no, what? Three minutes, what? <laughs> and then he didn't. <laughs> do you remember this? Yeah. Characterize it for... Uh, you people, were upset. You? <laughs> oh, voices were raised. Uh, epithets were tossed. Um, I went I... nuts. Yeah. Well, I don't think at that moment they had a strategy for passing it yet. But you know what? That night, Obama said they're going to do what they did. Right. Which is have Nancy pass it. And just take the House bill up as a whole. But they did not at that moment. And you revealed that. And that was uncomfortable. But that forced the White House then to make a choice to adopt a strategy. And the choice really was, it was not an easy one. It was a historic one. The choice was let it go. Pass some really small thing, a little bit of reform. You don't want to which fail. Which is the what way, Rom wanted to do. Which, which is what Rom wanted. Which to do. is what I think, in part, because we failed in the Clinton administration, and then came back with Kennedy, Kassebaum, and Chip. The Children's Health Insurance Program was quite a good program. We came back with some incremental stuff that we we took on big tobacco. We did some good things on health, but we failed on the big thing. And there was counsel to President Obama to say, "Don't make the mistake Clinton made. Don't overreach." And uh, you and others were saying. This is our chance. Reach. <laughs> and to his eternal credit, he took the, the Pelosi ACA and said, let's just ask the Senate to adopt it as is. So there's no need for a conference committee. Uh, that was a historic uh, choice. And you did help force that uh, in a, a pretty hot moment. I, I, I bet Axelrod remembers, too. He very much remembers. And what's funny about this, what's funny about this is I love Axelrod, by the way. Yes, great. But I was screaming at him, and I was using the F word as even more often than I do here <laughs> on the podcast. And I was friggin' incensed because I thought that was the only reason we were there, right? So then later in his in his book, which I would recommend not as highly as yours, <laughs> he says like, well. It's a good thing that Al wasn't a dramatic actor, but, but he was a comedian because, you know, I didn't buy it. And then, so then I, I, next time I talked to Axel, I go, what? If that was acting, then I was a great actor. 
I got to say. Well, do you remember after you finished it, David did his best? I've been there. I've been there. I was a White House aide, and there are times you don't really have a strategy, you don't know what to do, and you don't want to admit that in front of a room full of senators. But after you finished, he gave as good an answer as he could, and you followed up. And then I guess I was the MC, and I called on, and I can't remember who, Al. It was one of your colleagues. Bill MC. Nelson. What, uh, was Bill Nelson? I thought there was a – there's somebody sitting to your right. Well, it might have been Carl Levin. It might have been Carl Levin. I remember you did. I remember Carl spoke up. I remember Bill Nelson spoke up. I remember Bill Nelson, who's the sweetest right. fucking guy. He goes like, um, David, you didn't really answer Al's question. That's right. <laughs> and that's when you know you're in trouble. Right? When, when these senators have each other's backs, when instead of saying, hey, I've got an issue, you know, on the Florida coast. It affects my state. And that was even worse. That was even more uncomfortable because it's like, okay, there was this big eruption. And, and believe me, Axe got the memo, right? I promise you, he went back and said, hey, Mr. President, we got to figure something out here. But when Senator Nelson then, you're right, very mild-mannered, very courtly, very polite man. When he it said It was kind that, of like, I know Al sounds <laughs> like a nut. <laughs> <laughs> but he is right. You know, and then I wrote him, I wrote Axelrod a note when it passed that just said, you're welcome. I wonder if he framed that. I don't know. I'll ask him. He's going to be doing, actually, this podcast uh, in a little bit, in a, in a month or so. I, I love him. He's great. He's, He's a terrific guy. guy. I was literally emailing with him this morning. He's just a, a, a great guy and a big-hearted guy, as well as a big yeah, brain. No, absolutely. He's a terrific guy. And, uh, yeah, I love David Axelrod. God bless you guys, you really good political souls. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for you, you know, I know that people go, ah, political consultants. No, no, political consultants are pretty great when they're great. One thing about my former profession, political consulting, a lot of people do it and they have some success and then they become lobbyists and they trade on those relationships. David Axelrod never did that. James Carville never did that. Um, and I, I think that that revolving door, which is completely unregulated, is, is problematic. I know this. When you're on the campaign with someone, as you know from your days and your staff, you know them very, very well. And it seems a betrayal to me to turn and lobby them. But that's the Manaforts and that's the Stones. That's those people. I don't really know a lot of Democrat consultants who do that. Maybe. I, I don't know. No, it is mostly on the Republican side. And that is, uh, I think it's a betrayal. As you know, you, you get to know these people so well. And it's not right to go back and lobby them then and say, let me tell you why the coal companies are actually right, Al. <laughs> and or it's better like this will help you in your state right right because i was your political consultant i was i i was your media advisor in the state and i saw all the poll i know your state i know your polling i know everything this is better for you you know um well uh congratulations on the book if you read this book it will be a great guide for you uh going forward and in, in in helping to win this election. Um, thank you for this book, and thank you for your friendship, Paul. Well, Al, thank you, and you've been a terrific friend to me and a terrific senator for the United States and for Minnesota, so thank you. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. <laughs>